Hey everyone, and welcome to Changing the Game in Bill Coke League Skiing. My name is John O'Sullivan, and I'm the founder of the Changing the Game Project, and in partnership with the New England Nordic Ski Association, I'm so excited to be here with you today to tell you a little bit about the Bill Coke League and why it is so important that A, your kids participate in this, that B, you understand um, why they're going to be there and what they're going to want from their coaches and what they're going to want from you as parents as well. And then finally, how you can make this experience uh, a great one for them. Now, if you're new to the Bill Coke League, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about it. You know, The mission of the league is to introduce young people to a lifelong sport of cross-country skiing with all of its fitness benefits and its recreational and social and competitive opportunities. And the philosophy of the Bill Coke League is that children should have the opportunity to have fun while learning to cross-country ski. Uh, the Bill Coke League is it's a cross-country ski program for eight, children ages 3 to 13, and it provides just a great environment for parents and children to enjoy the outdoors and, and learn to ski and have fun on skis. The New England Bill Coke League is the largest cross-country ski program for young people in the United States, and it's named after Vermont skier Bill Coke, who's the only Nordic skier from the United States who has ever won a medal at the Olympics. The 1976 Winter Olympic Games in Innsbruck, Austria, Bill Coke won the Olympic silver medal. In 1982, he was the pioneer of skate skiing and was also the overall World Cup champion. So this league is set up to carry on the legacy of of Bill Coke, not only for his success as a skier at the elite level, but because of his lifelong love of skiing. Because cross-country skiing, it's not just a winter sport, right? It's a, it's a way of life. So I want to dive right in. And there's a picture of Bill Coke back in 1977, hanging out with the kids, uh, just talking about his love of the sport. So I want to start with a little story here today to kind of frame our conversation. Um, and it's a story not really about sports, but it's a story uh, about the business world. And we all know a guy named Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon and the CEO of Amazon. Well, anyway, Jeff Bezos uh, tells a story where a, a couple of years ago, he was being interviewed by someone and, and the guy asked him, said, Jeff, how does Amazon predict what is going to change in the future so that you can stay ahead of the curve and so that you can be um, ahead of everyone else uh, and, and, and ready for these big changes to happen? And Jeff Bezos said something really interesting. He said, you know, a lot of people ask me that question, what's going to change? He said, but it's really the wrong question. The question that people should ask me, and they rarely do, is this one. What's not going to change? Because if we know what's going to be the same 10 years from now, 20 years from now, then we can invest our time and our money and our resources in those things. And we can be prepared right, for whatever the future holds. So he said, you know, what is Amazon known for? Amazon's known for things like, um, things like big selection, low prices, fast delivery. And Jeff Bezos says, I cannot imagine a world 10 years from now or 20 years from now where someone might say, hey, Jeff, love those low prices, but you know what? I ordered it and it showed up the same day. Can you slow down that delivery a little bit? Right? He said, so because we know those things are not going to change, that people are still going to want selection and low prices and fast delivery, we can put our money and our resources and our research into how do we make those things better. And so... I love that story because when it comes to youth sport, whether your your son or your daughter is a young skier or whatever they do, um, I think we spend a lot of time focusing on what things might change, what's going to be different 10 years from now. When in reality, if we spent our time and our effort and our money investing in the things that do not change, well, then we would create a sports system that would stop the 70% dropout rate and, and make something that kids want to be a part of. So I think when it comes to sports, there's really three things that do not change, right? Why kids participate in sports, what kids want from their coaches, and that parents make a huge difference in helping athletes to find the things that they're passionate about. And it's funny because this aligns so much with the Bill Coke League 
and and the New England Nordic Ski Association philosophy of, you know, why would you want to join this league? Because it's focused on deliberate play, right? At the heart of Bill Coke League are, are games both on and off the snow. It's focused on diversification and it's fo- focused on healthy competition. So I want to dive into these three things today in this video and help you understand, right, why do your kids participate in sports? What do they want from coaches? Because I know a lot of you are probably coaches as well. And parents, how can you help and how can you understand the athlete pathway? So let's dive right in. Okay, so the big question here that we should always come back to because it has not changed since I was a kid growing up in New York and you were all kids growing up and it's probably not going to change when my grandkids are growing up and that's why do kids participate in sports why do kids play and I think we all know the answer to this and if I was sitting in a room right now with a bunch of kids and I asked them they'd all yell out the same word together because it's fun kids play sports because it's fun now as adults I think sometimes we don't understand how kids define fun what makes sports fun Um, We think that fun is fooling around or fun is all sorts of silliness. But actually what kids tell us is that makes sports not fun. So there's a woman named Amanda Visick from George Washington University, and she's done a ton of research in this area, what she calls her, her fun maps. What are the 81 characteristics that make sports fun? And it's things like a positive team dynamic, learning new things, the excitement of competition, getting to play. All that makes sports fun. What makes it not fun? Well, oftentimes criticism and yelling, fear of making mistakes, not getting in a game. Those are the things that make sports not fun. And so we have to understand that there's a difference, I think, between uh, pleasure and enjoyment. Because sports has to be about enjoyment but not necessarily pleasure. Certainly in a sport like cross-country skiing, which is incredibly taxing cardiovascularly, there are moments where you're not feeling a lot of pleasure. Or the example I always use is if you've ever run a marathon, mile 20 to 26, there's very little pleasure, but you still can enjoy running. Well, sports can be about working hard and getting better and pushing yourself, but at the same time, it has to be about enjoyment. Kids have to say, I can't wait to do that again. And so we have to always focus on this because this is not going to change. Nine out of 10 kids, the first thing they say, why do you play sports? It's because it's fun. Why do your kids ski? Because it's fun. And when it stops being fun, the way they define fun, they're going to stop skiing. Now, an eight-year-old might define fun very differently than an 18-year-old or a 28-year-old Olympian. But I can guarantee you that they still get great enjoyment out of their sport. And when the enjoyment goes away, whether they're an elite international level skier or someone just starting out, they're probably going to do something else. Now, one of the things that you should also realize is that when your children start sports, right, there are, there are, in sports, there are on one of two paths, what we call a participation pathway and a performance pathway. Right? Now, I think every kid starts in sport on the partici- participation pathway. I've never met a six-year-old soccer player who shows up and says, Hey, coach, you know, I'm ready to grind here today. I'm ready to get to work. You know, No, they're there for fun. Right? They're there to just enjoy the heck out of themselves, uh, to be with their friends, to learn new things. Now, some kids start moving onto that performance pathway where, it, where they want a little more, where they want a little more serious, where they want a little to be pushed a little harder, where they want a little more challenge. But we have to always remember and, and really recognize in our own kids, well, what path are they on? What we're not very good at in North America is we look at calendar years and decide when kids leave participation and move to performance. And if a 10-year-old doesn't show the desire to be on that performance pathway, we think something's wrong with him. Or we say, well, you know what, this is not for you. We don't have a space for you anymore. And one of the beautiful things about the Bill Koch League is it allows for kids on either pathway to have a great experience in cross-country skiing. And what it also allows them to do is just evolve from one pathway to the other on their own time. 
and on their own schedule. Now, one of the things that I always like to talk about is this idea of how are kids going to perform when that race day rolls around. And so I like this little equation. It's from one of my favorite books called The Inner Game of Tennis by a man named Tim Galway. And he says that performance equals potential minus interference. So how your son or your daughter is going to perform on race day is going to be their potential, which is, you know, their genetics, their hours of practice, the coaching they've received, their motivation, how they're feeling that day, right? Are they sick or are they healthy? Is their mind clear or not? You know, minus interference. And the single greatest thing that interferes with performance is a lousy state of mind. It's what's between their ears. And my whole game changing, my whole book changing the game is about this. How do we strip away interference from our kids so that they can perform up to their potential? And one of the things that kids tell us over and over and over is that, you know, a lot of the interference. A lot of the things that make sports not fun, it comes from the adults. It comes from the coaches. It comes from their parents. And what we know is this, is that when you have mental cognitive interference, you can't perform as well. So there's a psychological effect called the Stroop effect. It was uh, um, discovered by a man named John Ridley Stroop in the 1930s. And basically what it shows is that Cognitive interference, so mental interference, slows down the physical reaction time of a task. So basically what happens is when you add mental interference, someone cannot perform physically as well. And I want to show you what I mean because we're all going to take the Stroop test together. So if you're watching this at home by yourself, um, you can listen along with me. And if you have some others that you're watching it with, I suggest that you all do this together. So here's part one of the Stroop test. You have a bunch of words on the screen that represent different colors. And what we're going to do is we're going to read them out loud as fast as we can go. Now in a room of two or 300 people when I do this, we can usually get this done at about 8, 9, 10 seconds around there. So if you have some people around you to watch, we're going to do this together out loud as fast as you can go line by line. On your mark, get set, go. Green, yellow, purple, red, blue, yellow, red, purple, red, blue, yellow, red, blue, red, green, yellow, purple, blue, red, green, blue, blue, yellow, purple. All right. How'd that go for you? Were you ahead of me? Were you behind me by a little bit? Was there any interference at all trying to say them out loud yourself while I was reading them? Can you imagine what it would be like in a room of two or 300 people reading these out loud? But yet, there's really not a lot of interference in this task right here. This is a pretty simple task. Read a word, all right? Read a word, read a word, read a word, all right? Now we're going to take the Stroop test together. And my uh, caveat with taking this test is depending on the screen you're watching at, sometimes these colors are a little different than what I'm going to say and what I'm going to see on my screen. Um, but I'll, I'll give you my best shot. So now in the Stroop test, what we're going to do is instead of reading the word, you have to say the color. So instead of saying green, you have to say blue. Instead of saying yellow, you have to say red. These are the same words, the same font, And we're going to do this together all the way down through and see how long this takes us. Are you ready? On your marks, get set, go. Blue, red, green, blue, yellow, blue, purple, green, green, yellow, red, purple, yellow, green, purple, blue, red, green, purple, yellow, red, purple, Yellow, blue, ah! <laughs> how'd that go for you? Are you at your office right now talking out loud and your coworkers are looking at you like, what's going on over there? So that's the Stroop test. Did you see how much longer that took you? It usually is double to triple the amount of time for a room to finish that. And I think this is what it's like for a young soccer player to play with two coaches yelling on one side and 32 parents screaming on the other, 
right? It's not a flow state. It's a, a state of interference. And when an athlete carries interference into his or her ski race, when they're worried about what mom and dad are going to think afterwards, when they're worried that they're not going to do well enough, when they're worried that their coach might get angry, when they're worried about the weather or whether the wax is right on their skis, they ski in this color scheme right here, right? And it's not a very good thing. They're never going to perform their best. So one of the things that we have to realize is what, what are some of the things in sports that cause interference and how do we overcome them? So I call these the three big myths that cause kids to quit. And we're going to go through uh, them one by one and talk about them. So here's the first big myth. The push for early specialization. Um, when you think about how sports is different from for kids today than it was when you were growing up, this is one of the things that we hear all the time. We hear that we're asking kids to do so much more at such younger ages. You got to commit year round to soccer by age seven or hockey if you think you're going to be good or if you're going to get into the developmental pipeline. And one of the things I love about the Bill Koch League is that it supports diversification. It's not just about skiing. It's about all-around athletic development. And this is actually backed by the science. So what the actual science says is that outside of female gymnastics and figure skating, where those athletes actually hit their athletic peak at you know in their early to mid-teen years, in most sports, athletes don't hit their peak until their 20s. And so this idea that you have to pour in all these hours at a really, really young age, it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense at all. What we do know is that children who pick a single sport really, really young and do that sport to the detriment of all others are far more likely to get injured to the tune of 70 to 90% higher injury rates, double the rates of overuse injury. They're more likely to burn out and drop out and become one of that 70% that quit sports by the age of 13. What we know from the US Olympic Committee is that the vast majority of their athletes, over 90%, have participated in multiple sports up through their early teen years. So the pathway to elite performance is actually not to specialize early, but to specialize later especially in what we call CGS sports, centimeters, grams, seconds, sports that are measured like that. Now, there are certain techniques that you might have to learn at a young age, right? There's certain things in early engagement, right? Love of sport, loving to play is important, but it doesn't mean that you have to do that to the detriment of all other things. Now, sadly, a couple of years ago, there was a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell that hypothesize that there's this 10,000 hour rule that if you put in 10,000 hours into a specific task you're going to be an expert at it but sadly there is no such thing as a 10,000 hour rule there was a man named Anders Ericsson who was studying expertise in sport and he was looking at the efficacy of practice what kind of practice do you do what kind of practice leads to expertise and what he found looking at looking and studying musicians in Berlin was that they had all put in various amounts of practice to become elite violinists. And on average, it was about 10,000 hours. But there is no 10,000 hour rule. There is no magic boundary. Every athlete follows their own path. Certain sports are transferable to others, meaning someone who does basketball might become better at soccer, or someone who plays soccer might become better at basketball because they have similar patterns, much like someone who's a, a Nordic skier can benefit from cycling and things like that. So this idea that you had to put in these, these magical 10,000 hours led a lot of people to push this specialization age younger and younger, and it's just not healthy for kids. Now, one of the things that 
has happened because of early specialization has been this push to make cuts and to really focus on childhood success. Right? Did we get on the winning team? Did we did we win the most games? Did we group all the best kids together as soon as possible and got rid of the quote bad kids? But the things that we forget about is who are the quote kids who aren't as good end quote when they're really young prior to age 16. And and it's not really when you when you're making cuts and when you're grouping the quote best kids together at 7 8 9 10 11 12 years old um it's not the kids who have the best long-term potential it's usually the kids who have grown first so here's a picture taken by my friend in England of two 12-year-old boys born one week apart i think you can see the difference those are two kids at totally different places on the developmental timeline. And yet, they're considered to be the, quote, same age. But they're not the same age at all. When we are making cuts, when we are telling kids you're off the pathway, oftentimes, they are born at the end of the calendar year. Meaning that if your calendar cutoff date is September 1st, most of your, quote, elite athletes will be born in September, October, November, and December. But a kid born in July or August, he's a year younger. She's a year younger. They're not going to look the same as those kids. They're going to look like these two boys, even though these two were born right next to each other. Um, A 12-year-old boy, for instance, could have a five-year developmental age swing, meaning that he might have the body of a 10-year-old or he might have the body of a 15-year-old. Now, you probably don't ever have your 10-year-olds compete against your 15-year-olds in a sport, yet that's what we do when we only group by calendar year and when we focus on, well, look how good he is or look how good she is at these young ages. What we need to do, and one of the brilliant things that Bill Koch League does, is it creates a great environment for as many kids as possible and keeps them involved in this sport for as long as possible, right? Let's them get into their growth spurt and then sees what happens. But it does not exclude kids at very young ages because they haven't put in a lot of hours into cross-country skiing or because they haven't yet, uh, you know, because they're one of the smallest It allows us to find not just the talent that shouts, but the talent that whispers, right? So don't get caught up in how well your kid is doing early on. Get caught up in, do they love what they're doing? Now, the third big myth is this idea that sports is an investment with a financial return, right? That sports, you know, if we do this, if we get in there, there's a scholarship. Now, I understand certainly that in the sport of skiing, there's not as many scholarships out there as there might be in soccer or uh, basketball or football or things like that. But I think one of the most important things that we can do as parents is focus on um, the, the life skills that sports can teach our kids. And if you think about a sport like Nordic skiing, right? Resilience and grit, commitment, teamwork, and working with others like this great picture shows, um, because we can certainly practice when there's not a lot of snow. Um, It teaches things like setting a long-term goal and working to it, dealing with adversity, right? Dealing with failure, all these sort of things that are important life skills that transfer from, from the sporting arena to the boardroom, And that's the investment that sports has for your kids. There is no investment in sports worth not having a relationship with your kids years down the line because you were pushing them towards some goal that maybe they didn't even want or you were doing it in the wrong way. What we know is that across all sports, only about 3% of high school age athletes play a college sport and about 1% get financial aid to do so. So the financial return on playing sports regardless of what they are is not a great one but if you are intentional as a parent and you are intentional as a coach about teaching character man really really good things can happen right really good things can happen so focus on those 
those those intangible things, right? And if you, your kid is good enough to get a scholarship, that's the icing on the cake. But it, it can't just be the cake itself. All right. So let's now dive into the coaching aspect of things. All right, we talked about these three things that don't change for kids. So number one, why do they play? And number two, what do kids want from coaches? So I will offer you the opportunity right here if you like, if you have a pen and paper, that you can just pause the video and write down the five qualities of the best coach that you ever had. And it doesn't matter what sport it is. And if you say, I never had a, a great coach, um, well, the best teacher you ever had, that person who pops into your head right away, who makes you feel a certain way. So if you're going to do this activity, and I suggest you do, um, hit pause right now, and I'm going to keep going and keep teaching um, and and uh, to to finish this activity. But go ahead and and list the five qualities of the best coach you ever had. Hit pause now. All right. So if we're back here, if you hit pause and wrote those things down, what I'd like you to do is circle of those five words or phrases that describe the best coach you ever had. Um, circle the ones that have to do with knowledge of the sport. Right? Right? So anything that has to do with X's and O's, because it doesn't matter what coach this, or what sport this coach coached, right? So circle the ones that have to do with the X's and O's, and look at your list for a second. Now we do this activity in big rooms, and we use sticky notes, and we have people write these down. And then what we do is we have them put the sticky notes on opposite walls, and on one wall we put all the sticky notes that have to do with a coach's knowledge of sport, the one you just circled, and then we. Ha on the other wall, put everything that has to do with connection, right? The ability to connect or what we call emotional intelligence. And these are things like caring and inspiration and honesty and fairness, motivation, right? Respect. And we've done this all over the world and the walls always look the same. One wall has about 80 to 90% of the sticky notes. And guess which wall that is? I imagine yours looks the same. It's the wall about connection. Coaching is not an X's and O's business. It's a relationship business. And we have to, as coaches, improve that side of our coaching as well. Teddy Roosevelt said it best, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that is the number one quality of great coaches, according to our research. Caring. They care about their athletes, not just as athletes, but as people. You have to focus on the connection side of coaching. You have to focus on the relationship side of coaching. And as organizations, we have to focus on those type of qualities when we're asking for our volunteer coaches. If you look at Amanda Visick's research, you'll find that she discovered the same thing. When she asked kids to list the top five qualities of their coaches, this is what they came up with. Respect and encouragement, positive role model, clear communication, knowledge of the game, someone who listens. Four out of the five have nothing to do with their ability to teach technique, their ability to teach race strategy. It has to do with the ability to connect, to communicate, to model good behaviors. And I think even as an adult, if you look at this and say, what do I want from my boss in work? What do I want from the people I work with? I bet you these are pretty similar qualities because this is leadership, right? Respect and encourage the people that work for you or play for you. Model the right behaviors communicate them effectively, listen to what people are saying, and know what you're talking about. And you see the source there at the bottom. This is a great resource, youthreport.projectplay.us. Take a look at that. Uh, it's the Project Play initiative from the Aspen Institute on how we can reform and stop this huge dropout rate in 12 and under sports. So this is what kids want from coaches, and I imagine that the qualities of your best coach were very similar as well. 
that it's not just what we do, it's how we make people feel. Now, what's really cool is that the United States Olympic Committee has jumped on board with this. Their director of coaching education, Chris Snyder, has teamed up with Wade Gilbert, a great coaching researcher and professor at Fresno State, to come up with what they call the quality coaching framework. So one of the big issues was, well, how do we define quality coaching? How do we know if a coach is doing his or her job? And if it's just that, hey, we won lots of medals or my athlete uh, you know, is the state champion, well, if next year your athlete isn't the state champion, does that mean you're not a good coach anymore? Of course not. So we had to redefine what does quality coaching mean. And what Wade and Chris came up with in this quality coaching framework is basically there's three parts. Essential coaching knowledge, and we just kind of talked about that right there. Knowledge of your sport, interpersonal knowledge, so this knowledge of relationships, those five qualities, and intrapersonal knowledge. Know yourself. What makes you emotional? Do you get emotional? What stresses you out? Do you take care of yourself? Right? How do you communicate with kids? How were you coached and was that a positive thing and are you changing it or just coaching the same way that you coached? Have you evolved every year as a coach or have you coached the same way 20 straight years? The last one on the list is contextual fit and that goes back to that performance versus participation pathway. What type of athletes are you coaching? What is the context? What is their developmental age? Are they on that performance elite pathway or are they just on the sport for participation pathway? And then finally, athlete-centered outcomes. And I want to dive into this as well. See, in traditional coaching, we've always looked at athlete-centered outcomes as, hey, can we just teach competence? Right? Can we teach the skills of this sport? I'm a coach. I impart skill. But what we're now saying in the United States is that quality coaching is not just teaching competence, the first of the four C's, right? The sports-specific technical performance skills. But as coaches, we are responsible for teaching confidence, right? Self-belief, resilience, mental toughness, positive self-worth. We are responsible for building connection, the interpersonal skills with our athletes, the the connection amongst teams, and and the positive relationships that kids look for in their programmings that make sports fun. And we're also responsible for developing character, right? Respect for sport and others, integrity, self-discipline, good decision-making. If we are doing quality coaching work, we're focusing on those four C's. So if you are a coach and you're worried about your knowledge of skiing, it's okay because you can still develop confidence. You can still build a great team and you can still within that team teach character and good things happen. Now I want to show you a way to develop those last three C's and also to uh, develop the competence piece as well because you can create an environment where where people will learn faster, where people will have more focus and bring more energy to practice. And this is about creating what we call a values-based team culture. And so this little sheet here is an activity that I did with an 11-year-old girls, 10 and 11-year-old girls soccer team that I was coaching. So I sat down, I live in Bend, Oregon, and I sat down with these girls and I said to them, Ladies, we are going to, uh, you're going to give me some adjectives that describe a great teammate. And this is what they came up with. Teamwork, encourager, helpful, sportsmanship, supportive, respectful, great attitude, fearless, positive, focused, kind, caring, loyal, hard worker, trustworthy, good listener. 20 minutes this activity took that they came up with these words. Not me, but them. And they said, this is the type of teammate that I want to be. At the bottom of that sheet, I commit to being the type of teammate described above. And they all signed it. Now, these 10 and 11-year-old elementary school age girls were able to define this is who I am and this is what I want to be. They were able to come up with values and they were able to make a commitment to those values. And if you see at the bottom, you'll see the John there at the bottom because I signed it as well. Right? I said to them, um, hey, you know what? I have to be, you know, just committed. I have to be that positive role model as well. Now, if you take 
15 to 20 minutes and do this with your team, what's going to happen is you're going to have a value system. But the magic happens when you start teaching those values. So what I do is every day, and I have a couple of them, of course, that are my favorites amongst this, right? Being fearless, being positive, uh, being a hard worker, you know, and competing, being focused, things like that. Um, At the beginning of every practice, I tell them, this is what we're going to work on today from a technical, tactical standpoint. And our value of the day is, how about being fearless? Right? We're going to learn something new. So our value today is being fearless. And I say to them, what does it mean to be fearless? And they define it. Fearlessness means trying new things, not being afraid to make a mistake. And I say, great. Now during practice, I don't just catch people making a great pass or scoring a great goal, but I also catch them trying something new and messing up and say, hey, Sam, that's okay. Because our value today is what? being fearless. That's right. And you tried that and it didn't come come off, but do it again because here we value fearlessness, right? What a powerful, powerful thing when we can teach those values. Now at the end of practice, when I bring the team together and say, this is what we covered today, we talk about our value again. And I say, what is, what was our value today? Fearlessness. Would any of you like to give your teammates, one of your teammates, a shout out for being fearless or any other one of our values? And now at the end of practice, the players get to give each other acknowledgement for epitomizing what we value most. Look at these things. These are character traits. These are confidence building traits. These things build connection amongst teams. They build accountability things like that. And when you have those things, you develop competence faster as well. Now, what I found is that in practices, if I forget to do shout outs, the kids usually remind me and say, coach, we didn't do shout outs today, right? We've got to do shout outs. So I think it's such a hugely impactful thing. Now I take a picture of my value sheet. I send it to the team parents and I say, this is what your daughter's have said they want to be about this season. So what I need you to do is you talk about these things as well. And at the end of the year, I don't give out an MVP or a most improved. I reward the values. Who showed the most positivity? Who was the best communicator? Who was the hardest worker? Who was the best listener? Who had the great attitude? Who was the most supportive? And it's such a cool thing because every kid on the team is capable of winning one of those awards. So take the 20 minutes that it de- that it takes to create your values. Take five minutes of every practice to come up with the value of the day and give a shout out at the end and catch your athletes being good. Catch them epitomizing your value and you are going to create an environment that develops those four C's of competence, confidence, connection, and character. Now, here's your bonus activity, coaches, as well. Um, And I call this the most helpful question that I ask my athletes. And I just started doing this um, because I read a book called What I Wish My Teacher Knew. And um, I hand all the players a piece of paper and I ask them to finish this sentence for me. One thing that I wish my coaches knew about me that would help them to coach me better is dot, dot, dot. And I say, take five minutes, 10 minutes, finish that sentence. And some of the things that you will hear from your from your athletes are incredible. You might hear, now I think, you know, you do this sort of age, you know, 10 and up, nine and up, right? I don't know that you do this with three-year-olds, of course not, right? Or five-year-olds, well, they can't probably write anyway, right? But if you do this with these later elementary school and middle school kids and high school kids, you get some insight that you might coach a kid for a whole year or two years or three and never know about them, about what goes on at home, about the ride home after races, about how nervous they feel, about how they'd like you to communicate with them. You ask this question, you get the kids to write it down, you collect the answers, you refer back to them, and and if you act upon this, you build this incredible connection with your athletes. You get incredible insight 
into who they are and what they need from you. So that's your bonus activity if you have the kids at the right age. One thing that I wish my coaches knew about me that would help them to coach me better is dot, dot, dot. Okay, and part three of the things that don't change, right? So review, we talked about thing that, that is not going to change in sports. Number one, why kids participate, right? Because it's fun. Number two, you know, what they want from their coaches, which is connection and good communication and being a positive role model and knowing what you're talking about. And then number three, parents make such a huge difference. And the role of parents in the Bill Koch League is is massively important. You know, it it relies on volunteers, right? It's Bill Koch League is primarily a parent-run volunteer organization and we need you to volunteer during the season. There's so many different jobs that you have an opportunity to sign up for early in the year from just giving out high fives to assisting in classes that need a parent helper. And they don't require a lot of commitment or or skill. They just require love. They just require the ability to connect. And it's an incredible way for you to also build friendships and connections to other parents in the club. But your participation, that is the cornerstone of the New England Bill Coke League, right? And it's not a coincidence that children who stick with cross-country skiing are those whose parents uh, who come to ski with them or, or to watch them race. Because without your cooperation and involvement on all levels, um, this league will not succeed. So... What are some things that you can do besides volunteer? And I think this is really important, right? And, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of directors of sport for almost every Olympic sport in the United States. And when I ask them, what message can I pass on to parents? They always come back to these three things, right? The things that you can help your kids to develop are passion and enjoyment for the sport right? They have to love it. Number two, when they love it, they might own it. And if they own it and they love it, they'll build this intrinsic motivation to improve, to go out there and get better, right? That is the greatest gift that you can give to your kids. You are not just the advocate for the athlete. You're the advocate for the person. And if you can help them develop that love of sport and take ownership of it and say, I want to get better at this, um, and and then it's not external motivation, but inside them says, I want to get better. I want to go compete. That is the greatest gift you can give to your kids. If anyone's listening to this that has skied on a higher level or played any sport on a high level, you know, college or professionally, what you know is that the pathway is a tough one. It takes a ton of work. You give up a lot of things. It takes incredible dedication and perseverance, dealing with injuries, things like that. Sometimes it takes a little bit of luck too. And you don't get through all those things on this really long marathon of sport development unless you love it and unless you own it and something burns within you to get better. So help your kids develop those things. Number two, just be patient with talent development. Right? Be patient with talent development. I, I like this little thing because you know a lot of times we think that talent development is the straight line. Right, I sign my kid up here, and eight years later he's here. But it's really on the right. Right, it goes in fits and starts. Some kids shine bright early and then fade off. Some take a long time to get going and then and then shoot up at the end. But oftentimes it's messy. You get a little bit better and then you take a few steps back. You're on a great path and then you have an injury right? You you have a lousy snow here or something happens where they fade back. And so we have to take the long view as parents, right? If I promote that love of sport, that it it doesn't really matter so much what happens this season. It's that, that you love it and you keep working towards something bigger and, and something longer. I coached a young woman, woman in soccer who was also a very competitive Nordic skier she went and played a year of college soccer and then decided to go back to Nordic skiing, transferred schools, and ended up representing the United States in the World University Games. Right? So her path was not the typical path as you might look at it. Right? So be patient 
as they grow and follow their pathway in sports. Now, the next thing is, for some reason, um, in many aspects of our kids' life, right, we act a certain way. We have this patience. Right? We have this understanding. But in sports, we don't. So I have this quick little video for you uh, of my daughter at her first piano recital. I want you to look and see what happens when she makes a mistake. So she's a couple months into piano, right? Her hand doesn't reach across a full octave, right? That's the limit of my piano knowledge there. We don't expect her to play Tchaikovsky, right? We have this great patience. And when she makes a little bobble, and she does pretty well, but she makes a bobble, right? Do we hear her coach or her piano teacher scream at her? Of course not. Do we hear the parents moan and groan? No. Right, have you ever been to a school orchestra concert uh, with a middle schooler or even a high school sometimes and it's kind of painful <laughs> to listen to? Have you ever heard a parent jump up and be like, oh, the woodwinds are killing us tonight? No, of course not, right? Because we understand that these things are really hard and they take a long time to learn. But you go to a soccer game and everyone's yelling and screaming, shouting instructions to kids. You go to a basketball match or a lacrosse game even a ski race, right? We forget that these are not many adults, that this is not supposed to look like the adult version of the sport just yet, that we need to be patient, right? that we have to just let it happen. And I think most importantly, that our kids know that we love them, that we just love to watch them ski. That could be the most important thing that you ever say to them after a meet. After a race, I love to watch you ski. It's the most important thing that I say to my kids. It's the best thing I've ever learned. I learned it from a friend named Bruce Brown. And it, it frees them from the burden of being responsible for your happiness. And it frees them from the burden of, of, of thinking that your love for them depends on how they do. Now, one of the biggest places that kids say we need to just love watching them ski is the ride home. It's the ride home after a race. Because if you think about it, you know, our athletes, and, and this goes for any sport they play, they're physically and emotionally exhausted, right? Oftentimes we're emotional as well. And yet we got them locked in the car. We got a long drive home from the mountains. And we're going to make this a teachable moment. And what our kids tell us over and over is that maybe this is the least teachable moment. There's some research out of Australia which found that kids say oftentimes the ride home is their worst memory of youth sports. And the reason being that as adults, we rarely consider our kids' state of mind and our own state of mind when we decide to have this conversation. It's too close to the event. Now, I speak to kids all the time and people, they roll their eyes and say, oh yeah, the ride home. I've coached kids who have, you know, you could tell at the end of a game um, when they weren't having a good game, they'd start looking at the sideline and they're getting uh, changed after the game. And they'd say, coach, I wish I was going home with someone else. This is going to be a miserable ride with my dad, right? The ride home has to be a safe place. Now, if your kids bring up the race, if they bring up the game and say, hey, how do you think I did? They're inviting you to have a conversation. And by all means, have that. Talk about the things that they can control. Don't talk about bad coaching or you know, bad refereeing or anything like that. Talk about the things that they control. Um, and when they put it to rest, put it to rest. But if you find that your kids are never bringing this up, if they're never talking about this, then um, 
Don't be the one. Find a better time. Have a conversation with your son or your daughter and say, when would be a good time to talk about your race? And if it's after dinner, maybe great. If it's in the hotel later, do it then. If it's at breakfast the next morning, do it then. But take the emotion out of it and and find that right time. Now, I think this is a really, really hard thing to do, right? Everyone struggles with this because, again, it seems like this perfect teachable moment. But what I think you will find is that if you let the ride home belong to your kids, then great things will happen. So here's what I suggest, right? And I always think that as parents, we can answer these five questions. And with the teams that I coach and the organizations that I run, um, I come up with these questions as well. I came up with them with a a basketball coach friend of mine who did this with his state championship program. And it helps parents be part of that culture that you're creating. So I think parents, we should always list list, uh, a personal and team goal you have for your kid this season. Right. Number two, think about, and you're going to write these things down, right? what do you want your child's experience to be like if he or she cannot accomplish that goal? Number three, what do you want your parent experience to be like? You want it to be uh, this fun connection and great friends with these other volunteer parents, or do you want it to be miserable? I don't think anyone's going to put down miserable. So you start writing down, what do you want your experience to be like? What can you do to help create that experience? So you can own this, right? Whether it's volunteering just for the high fives, whether it's having hot chocolate ready after the race, whether it's a whole multitude of things, you can help create that experience. And then organizations should also ask, how can the coaches help facilitate this, right? And usually that comes down to just great communication. Let us know where we stand. So I think if you're running an organization, you can have your parents write the answers down to these five questions and and publish them anonymously. But hey, this is what we want from this experience. And this is what we need from the coaches. And here's how we're going to contribute. It really helps parents become part of that culture with their athletes and with their coaches. And if we think of the experience as a three-legged stool, we cannot remove a leg or the stool falls down. So my last piece for you is this, just some recommended reading. Um, There's a new book out called The Power of Moments from Chip and Dan Heath. These guys are some of my favorite authors. They're funny. They bring in tons of research. One's a professor at Stanford. One's a professor at Duke. And they talk about how certain experiences have extraordinary impact. Most of your kids' most memorable experiences of their life will happen before their 20th birthday. And there is ways for us to look at these moments, and sports certainly creates the conditions for memorable moments, either positive or negative. And so if you take a look at this book, and you can find how you can create those great moments. On the right, we have Inside Out Coaching by Joe Ehrman how sports can transform lives. I think this is the first book that any coach should read. Joe Ehrman's a a former NFL player. He talks about the difference between being a a transactional coach, that you're in it for yourself, and a transformational coach where you're asking, what can I give? And finally, in the middle, I have a gift for all of you, which is a free ebook of my book, Changing the Game. Uh, This book came out in 2013, and it still seems to pop up on Amazon's bestseller list in in U Sports year after year. Um, You can get it on Amazon or barnesnoble.com, but I also want to give you the ability, you can download um, an ebook version for free. So the way you can get the book there on the bottom in yellow. You can just send a text to CTG Project. All um, send that send that word CTG Project to the number three three four four four, or you can go online to my website changingthegameproject.com forward slash free CTG book. Put in your email, and um, we'll send you a PDF of the book. Up top there, you can see my direct email address. We have a Facebook community with over 70,000 people. We have a big Twitter following as well. On our uh, changingthegameproject.com, we've had four years of of blog posts there as well. Um, 
we we run a coaching conference called the way of champions with my friend dr jerry lynch and we also have a podcast if you're a podcast listener that you can find on itunes or any of those called the way of champions podcast and we interview top coaches and elite athletes and researchers about how we can make sports better so I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank uh, New England Nordic Ski Association and the Bill Koch League for having me on. And I hope that whether you're a parent or a coach or both, that you can always come back to the things that don't change. Why your kids play? Why your kids ski? It's because it's fun. It's about enjoyment. What do they want from coaches? They want respect and encouragement. They want a good role model. They want good communication. And they want you to know a little bit about skiing, right? And that parents, you make the difference. And the most important thing that you can do is foster love and enjoyment of the sport. Help your kids own their experience. And those things develop their intrinsic motivation to keep going. Because ultimately, we're not just developing elite ski racers we're developing athletes who will love this sport for life and teach their own kids because there's nothing better than getting on the mountain with your own kids and just having a great day it's my favorite thing to do and i hope it is your favorite thing to do as well thanks so much for listening